Hello, everyone. How are you today? We are back with these fine gents. Uh, we're going to get right into the segment. What do you guys think about that? Sounds sure. great. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, what We got an echoey type thing going on, though. Is that me? Or was that just his? It was just his cans? It was his cans. <laughs> Work, I've worked with Corky before. We know the lingo. Uh, so welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know, where we talk about little bits and bobs of Dungeons & Dragons lore, Forgotten Realms lore, and how you can bring it into your game. And today I am joined, uh, I'm Greg Tito, first of all. Uh, I'm joined by Mr. Matt Cernet. Hello. And Mr. Chris Perkins. Greetings, everyone. We are here today to talk about Shemeshka the Marauder. Mm-hmm. That's right. Ah, nice. The king of the cross trade. Mm-hmm. The, what is the cross trade? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> what is Shemeshka? <laughs> what is marauding? Can you describe that? Let's start with the basics. Uh, Shemeshka is an Arcanoloth, yep. a type of Yugoloth um, fiend uh, who lives in the city of Doors, also known as Sigil. Mm, okay. So this is the Planescape setting. Uh, that's where that kind of all erupted. And she is the king of the cross trade. Cross tra- the um, Planescape se- setting has a lot of slang uh and cross trade is their slang for crime etc oh now it's all coming together mm-hmm. and you're you wearing the uh planescape yeah, torment yeah, shirt it here it is quite yeah. the lady of pain the lady of pain exactly all right uh so is is she a god is shemeshka a god no she's a fiend okay um and but she's very well informed because she has a criminal network that extends throughout Sigil and beyond. Um, because like all smart criminals, information is power to her. And anything that she can use to leverage, to gain leverage over another creature is highly desired. Yeah, so a lot of uh, her criminal network isn't like breaking an entry. It's um, getting uh, blackmail information or just knowing what's going to happen uh, soon because of X, Y, or Z, that kind of a thing. Yep. Interesting. One of the things that sort of set her apart when she was uh, first introduced in the Planescape setting and then when they expounded upon her in um, the Faces of Sigil accessory mm-hmm. for Planescape was that she, and I use the term she loosely because Arcana Loths are basically, it's. you know, it's. <laughs> uh, but she's, she's identified as a she. And um, even though her title is king, there's a lot of ambiguity, obviously, around that. Um, But she preens and fawns over her appearance and has attendants who dress her and comb her and make sure that she is as presentable as possible because for her, appearances are important. Um, False, though they may be. Right. Um, An Arcanoloth for those who don't know, is one of the more powerful Yugoloths. They specialize in arcane magic and are really, really, really good wizards. Okay. Um, And they hoard spells and other things, but they basically look like um, fox-headed humanoid creatures with tawny fur covering their, their bodies and sharp talons on their hands and they're often depicted in art or were often depicted in art by Tony Dieterlitzi as wearing spectacles which was sort of a humanizing element although I don't think they really need them <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting the minutiae of makes or, them look art smart. orders yeah. <laughs> All right. so, so, what it, so going back just before we move on uh, so what's a Yugoloth for those who may not know right like so. me so uh, there were demons and devils in original D&D and then there were things that were introduced that were daemons and um, and they were different. Uh, and then later on, the names all had to be changed in second edition because we were scrubbing out all the evil stuff because of the sort of uh, satanic panic I see. Uh, in the, the 80s and so on. And so... Uh, yeah, so demons became Tanari, devils became Beatazu, and the daemons became Yugoloths. Right. Okay. What it, now, what's the, in the devil, I know devils and demons and their blood war. Yeah. W- where do Yugoloths slash demons fit into that? So uh, devils are lawful evil uh, and demons are chaotic evil. And then Yugoloths are neutral evil. And they are painted largely as sort of mercenaries of the multiverse. Uh, you know, their, their version of evil um, is uh, kind of one that, doesn't get involved and it's like gets paid it's kind of a strange <laughs> it's 
<laughs> completely self-serving yeah. um, is the nature of neutral evil. They'll do anything for themselves, no matter what the pain it inflicts upon others. Right. And and the weird thing about the Yugoloths is that basically, um, you know, you, there aren't very many plots or adventures or anything out there that I can think of where the villain is a Yugoloth because the v- Yugoloths generally aren't the people who are, uh, you know, activating the pl- evil plot right they they sort of a, a sort of a passive evil in a weird way and yeah. and so they often uh, appear as henchmen yeah uh, bodyguards uh, that kind of a thing so yeah. it's it's kind of an interesting role for that that uh, sort of race if you will in the universe right they're the not their goal isn't st- sadistic or 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 in any kind of uh, uh yeah. You know, cruelness. It's just, uh, you know, I'm just doing this for my own yes. goals. Coincidentally, I did write a, um, a an adventure for Dungeon Magazine that had a Yugoloth villain oh. um, in issue 55 called Umbra. Um, but and he's a completely self-serving creature. Um, he's totally out for himself, and he's basically wreaking havoc for his own personal gain. I love that you're the only person that could be like, oh, yeah, I wrote that in, in <laughs> <laughs> number 55, I've a lot Matt. Of adventures. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, but, but Matt is absolutely right. They are often sort of subordinate or secondary to whatever main plot is going on. Um, our Canaloths, because they're so smart, are kind of really good mastermind villains. Um, and Shemeshka is the, the, the poster child for, uh, for that. Why is she called uh, the Marauder? Because you say she's, you know, a, a exchanger of, of yeah. information and crime. You know, I feel like a Marauder would be someone who's a warlord and out, you know, dominating and destroying. That's an excellent question. I don't think there's a very good answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, we can imagine that before she got, I mean, they uh, Yugoloths are um, basically mercenaries in the blood war a lot of the times, so, uh, basically demons and devils. Um, in the blood war have to pass through other planes to get at one another for the most part and one of the ways that they do that is by hiring uh, Yugoloths to um, either direct their forces or act as mercenaries for them and so on and so forth and so you can imagine Tomeska the Marauder might have been someone who was really important and uh, an important sort of general or captain or something like that in the blood war serving as a mercenary for one side or the other or both. And then eventually she gets to uh, Sigil and is like, well, this is fine. <laughs> I'll just do my thing here. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Right. So she was a, a previous marauder in, in another Perhaps. part yes. of her life. Yes. All right. That makes sense. Yep. Uh, let's see. Um, she, uh, other than appearing in the second edition Planescape products, she hasn't figured prominently in any published adventure as yet. Um although I recently picked her up and dropped her into my Dice Camera Action game where she's made several appearances. Right. Um, because it turns out one of the characters inherited a sword that was passed down through his family that was made by her for them and by inserting keys into its hilt, um, the Waffle Crew can summon her and bid her to provide them with uh, truthful answers to three questions if she knows the answers. Uh, and she does it as sort of part of this agreement that she set up with this family a long time ago. And what she gets out of that is sort of ambiguous at this stage, but as happens, uh, she she's going to make greater and greater demands on the party as time goes on, and as the information she possesses holds greater value to them. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, the reason I chose her was because I think that with all the Planescape characters that were created, she rises to the top as being one of the ones that has gained the most popularity among the fan base. And it's not altogether clear why. I'm not sure we've ever really um, delved down to find out what's appealing about her, other than I think there is a humanity to her that is relatable. Um, And she is a creature of many faults and... uh, desires and so uh, it opens her up to lots of possibilities for using her in a number of versatile ways yeah I think the ambiguity about her being helpful on the one hand but dangerously so mm. is also interesting yeah and in in Sigil she has a rivalry with another uh, Yugoloth uh, Akin who is also an Arcanoloth and he is the one who's depicted most often with the spectacles kind of way on the end of his nose and uh, and a weirdly luxuriant mustache coming off of it. Yeah, that's <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, it's no weirder than Shemeshka's razor vine headdress. Yes, but exactly. Yes. 
Uh, but yeah, and so they have some sort of rivalry, and, and he, Akin, is a, identifies as male, and he is a um, sort of seller of magical trinkets and uh, little objects and and, in, and information as well. Um, and so they they have some sort of there's sort of hints in in the various writings of her Planescape that there is this long running rivalry and hatred between them. Um, but exactly what the source of that is, or or and how that unfolds in in Sigil is is sort of left mysterious. Right, right. And Sigil is is important uh, because it is this uh, you know, kind of crossroads between right. the multiverse. It is the donut way. at the center of the multiverse. Right. Yeah. Uh, so her being uh, the owner of the information, or at least you know one of, one of the brokers of information in there, uh, is very important. Now, obviously, we're talking about things that are very specifically you know either Planescape uh, uh, or other, you know very D and D. But how can people use characters like Ugolas or like Shemeshka in in their campaigns? If you want to drop it, it's like, say, for example, like you said, oh, I just used her because it was useful at the time. Like, what kind of need did that serve in, in that story? Yeah. Um, well, I talked a little bit about what I'm what I'm doing in the in the dice camera action. She's there basically as a as a way for the characters to learn things that they might not be able to get otherwise. But every time they ask, of course, they're digging themselves a little deeper with her. And uh, and so the qu- the tension becomes: at what point do we stop contacting her when it becomes too great a risk? She's already made one of the characters do something for her under the power of a Gaius spell, so it, it could only get worse. But um, uh, I think that they're very versatile, Arcanaloths. Uh, for instance, one shows up in Curse of Strahd. Uh, you find it kind of locked away in the Amber Temple, which is this place where the powers of good basically locked away all this evil lore. And it kind of finagled its way inside, and it's like a kid in a candy store, really. It's just, it has no reason to go anywhere else because it's surrounded by all these things that it loves. Um, and it kind of serves as a guardian in that way. And it's actually um, a hostile threat. Um, if you come there seeking knowledge, it doesn't want to give you anything. And so it attacks you. Uh, and you have to be very, very wary of it because it has great magic at its disposal. That's a sort of different take on the Arcanaloth, one that's a little bit more vicious and inaccessible. Mm. I like you lost because they're uh, um, because of the mercenary quality and that sort of weird uh, neutrality of them. Uh, on the one hand, you have demons and they're sort of like these engines of destruction that like you, you just got to get rid of those things. They're <laughs> no good. On the other hand, you have, you have devils and they, they have all these contracts. They want to, you know, steal your soul and all this kind of stuff. And so like making any sort of deal or, or anything like that with devils always seems really, really dangerous. Whereas you have Yugo lost somewhere in the middle, and it's like they're really bad, but like you could maybe just pay this thing to go away, and yeah. it would. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it's like the villain's henchman, if you just offer it more money, it might be like okay, yeah, yeah, because yeah. he's got no loyalty, right. or you know, it, the fact that they're yes. that they're neutral evil it really plays into that. Yeah, you know, and then like, well, then maybe someone else pays it to come back, but <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like it, it is, it is really like a, it's like yeah. a fun thing where where um, you know it's this really evil thing that doesn't really necessarily care about you it just has its own desires and so it's not it's like a man it's not really doesn't really want to kill you you know like it's so there's just lots of room to role play with that sort of uh yeah, character that's a good point yeah yeah and uh uh the other thing that's worth mentioning about uh Yugoloths is that um they like many fiends have true names mm. that they keep hidden because to know a fiend's true name is to be able to control it Absolutely. And Arcanaloths are particularly hungry to learn the true names of other fiends so that they can hoard that information, dole it out to people as they will, Mm. and then uh, coerce fiends into doing their bidding by virtue of knowing what they know. So what's Shemeshka's true name? We have never said. (laughs) Never? (laughs) Never. You know, it's, I'm it's just asking on behalf of the Waffle Crew. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, it's <laughs> funny, help them out. like how often the idea of true names come up, and then how, like, I don't, I can't think of a in single instance in which the players know the true name, <laughs> like in any adventure where, where it's like, and here's the true name of so and so. So yeah. now you have power over them. Yeah, like, I can't think. Of, so that's a really fun thing to play with if if you want to do that. There is an Arcanaloth in Tomb of Annihilation, and I don't want to spoil it too much because. A lot of people haven't probably gotten to it yet, um, but there is the possibility of learning its true oh, name. Oh, nice! Huh? I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's cool. Built into the adventure. Nice. You're just yeah. full of being like, "Hey, but Matt, there's this thing." 
Yeah, his name is Bob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, apologies to Bob Salvatore. Yes. <laughs> and and in the adventure, when you learn its true name, you also if nobody's picked up on this yet, but there's a little there's a little Easter egg built in a little D and D Easter egg built into the name. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, neat. Okay, cool. Well, that that in itself will get people in uh, uh, yeah, people uh, like searching pouring, for it. pouring through the book now right. and figuring out what it is. Yeah. yeah. I, players, of course, will just want to find right. The, yes. The, the content yes. exactly know, right? that's that's in there, but that is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, anything more about Shemeshka uh, herself uh, that we want to, to to share? She's a terrible person, a creature. <laughs> 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 as nice as she may pretend to be, uh, you have to remember that Yugoloths are fiends. They are irredeemably evil. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, even if you think that they yes. may be helping you right. to, to, to for you know for yes. altruism, no, it's no, never that. There's no. They don't even understand altruism. I don't think. Or if they do, they just sort of laugh at it, um, like a failing of mortals. Uh, they are unequivocally self-serving. Um, that is, they are pure neutral evil in that regard. Are they, do, do they play on mortals' uh, ability to recognize altruism? Like, is it something that it's like, okay, I'm going to make you think that I'm your friend, or they the do smart it, don't one, even care? The smart ones do, but Yugoloths also run the gamut from being dumb as rocks to being super geniuses. Yeah. So the smart ones will, the dumb ones, no, they're just pure self-serving engines of hunger and, and willpower. Nice. Yeah. Makes sense. Kind of frightening. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that they have armies is even more frightening. <laughs> <laughs> and it's up for sale for mm-hmm. anyone who yeah. wants to if bring them. If you can afford a Yugoloth army, bully on you. Yeah. Just watch out. Make sure your enemy has more money than you do. <laughs> or had, knows more about the true names than you do. Right. Yeah. Yes. That might be worth it. And if I, I yes. know five fiends' true names. Yes. Come fight for me. There is the idea. It's in the monster manual for Yugoloths of, of the uh, of the book of keeping, which is uh, has all the names of, and all the sort of um, the number of, of Yugoloths because there's basically like a set limit number of Yugoloths. With demons and devils, it's a little bit different. Um, demons just get created by the abyss, like whenever. Uh, and devils kind of have to uh, elevate lawful evil souls from um, sort of weird larvae and other things, lemures that come out of the sticks and stuff like that, and turn them into greater, power, more powerful devils according to certain rules. And Yugoloths are, are it's neither of those things. They, they're just, they were created way back when with this thing with the Book of Keeping, and uh, that's yeah. all there is. And, and now they're in sort of a steady state of attrition. Every time a Yugoloth is forever destroyed, that's one less Yugoloth in the multiverse that will never come back. There's a finite number, and it will never. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a it's a mighty large number, yeah. but and you have to like go to their home plane where they all live. <laughs> <laughs> Not the safest kill, place kill in the there. multiverse, right. <laughs> right? And murder them all. Yeah. Yes. Like, oh, sh- finally, yeah. No more Shmeshkas around the world. Mm-hmm. Very cool. All right. Awesome. If people want to find out more about, uh, uh, you know, devils, demons, and demons, and Yugoloths, and Shemeshka, how can they get in touch with you guys? I am at Cernet on Twitter, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. And I am at Chris Perkins D-N-D. Awesome. Great, guys. Uh, I feel like I know more. And uh, you do, too. So thank you. We'll be back with another segment uh, next week. Thanks. Awesome. Very good stuff. Thank you, uh, Zakanan, for subbing uh, four ninety nine. Thank you, three months in a row. You're a good person. Uh, that's really cool. Uh, so I always love learning about this stuff. And there's some more ways you guys can learn uh, about some Dungeons and Dragons things. We just uh, I just got word th- this just in. Unearthed Arcana is now available on uh, the Wizards of the Coast website. That's right. The uh, playtest version of Elf Sub Races is up there for you guys to check out. Uh, they got a burial. Uh, the winged elves, Grugok, the wild elves of Greyhawk. Is that right? Am I pronouncing yeah. that right? That's right. Oh, yeah. goodness. Sea elves and Shatterkai, which we've mentioned uh, already uh, on this Lori Shino segment. Very good. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, so delve into that. Let me know what you think, and let us all know what you think uh, when we send out the Should elves link. have wings or shouldn't they? Let us know. <laughs> it turns out there's only like 100 of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's hotly contested uh, uh, amongst the D&D team. But not as bad as Tortles was. I feel like Tortles, you guys yeah, went all out. Tortles on. was pretty polarized at the time yeah and in a, in a, in a good fun way yeah 
Uh, all right, cool. Uh, also, uh, Force Gray Survive the Tomb is this Saturday uh, at Villain. If you're in the New York area, definitely go get tickets to go check it out. There's tons of uh, tickets available. No more VIP tickets. Those are all gone. But there are still general admission tickets. I think they're only $20 to watch Matt Mercer and uh, Deborah Ann Wall, Joe Manganiello, Utkarsh and Budkar, Dylan Sprouse, and Marisha Ray is joining the cast as a turtle. As a turtle, no less. As yes. a turtle. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. It is uh, going to be at 12 noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be broadcasting it from here, this Twitch channel, uh, at that time. So go check it out. And tonight at 5 p.m., there will be the penultimate episode of the season. Uh, episode 18 will be starting around 5 o'clock tonight. So stay tuned for that uh, when it comes, and you'll be all ready to go and binged up uh, for uh, the the finale. Uh, I was going to say premiere like I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But finale. Uh, uh, but this points for using the word penultimate. Oh, thank you. I feel like that's that usage of that word has increased over the last mm. five years. I don't know. I, have you guys noticed that? It used to be like something that was like you'd only see in a fantasy novel once in a right. while, and yes. then now it's yeah. in more conversation yeah. than ever. I think that's D&D. I think that's us. I don't think we can take credit. We're for increasing vocabulary well, that's usage well, that's, yeah. around the world. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I didn't know what a portcullis was until I started playing D&D. &D. Yeah. yeah. I was, I think, eight, and I was like, Dad, what's a scimitar? A scimitar. <laughs> <laughs> what's a, <laughs> like, what's a deus? Dias? 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 Dais? Dais. Uh, all right, awesome, cool. We're going to do one other segment of Lore You Should Know Now. Uh, but before I do, I just want to, in addition to Force Gray, Survive the Tomb, there was also uh, two, uh, three uh, performances by Chris Perkins in the next five days. Oh, my God. <laughs> so Dice Camera Action is tomorrow, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific yep, time. A regular time. Right, right. and that's episode yep. 67. Uh, ooh, no, that's 68. That's 68. Yep. And then Friday... In Philadelphia at PAX Unplugged at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, we return for episode 69 live, and it will be recorded. Nice. Yes, we'll actually have yes. the recordings. <laughs> Hopefully the time. not lost this time. <laughs> There's email <laughs> chains about redundancies just to make sure that yes, we are yes, redundant yes, yes, in, yes. in all the good ways, not all the bad and ways. And then Saturday, it's a live game of Acquisitions Incorporated with uh, uh, Mike and Jerry and Patrick and uh, Kate Welch playing Rosie B. Stinger. From the C team. Yep. And That's then awesome. Sunday, I get together with Scott Kurtz, Corey Cassoni, and friends to play Ben Wins Minions. Oh, nice. Yep. That's great. Um, and uh, also just uh, the Waffle Crew episode uh, 69 is live. It's going to be on mm -hmm. Friday at yep. 8.30 yep. p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, that is where all of the Waffle Crew will be in the first time, all of them in one place. Oh, interesting. Right? Isn't that true? It is. I thought we were keeping that secret. But it, are we keeping that secret? Not anymore. Shh. No? All right. Well, <laughs> for those listening, Don't tell anyone. for those listening, it is not a secret. Uh, you guys get it. You are now first. on the inside. That's right. You, uh, that's yeah. what you get for watching us uh, be yeah. jokers this time. Yeah. Uh, so that's cool. I yeah, think so we've never awesome. all been in one place at the same time. Yeah, not even in in passing. Not in real life. No. Yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty amazing. So you guys get to see it. Uh, I think it's going to be on the Twitch.tv slash Pax channel, but we'll be hosting it here. Uh, so just come and hang out with your own Waffle Fam here uh, yep. at that time. Cool. All right. So let's do uh, our next segment, and that is what should we just call it? Worms of the North? Worms of worms. the North. Worms. Yeah. Yep. Speaking of expanding vocabulary, specifically evil worms of the North. Wow. Yep. Yes. Of course. The They're chromatic the ones. Yes. Uh, and you send an email with the, the names, but I'm going to. I suggested a few. Yeah. 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 I mean, we can talk about any of them. There are dozens, yeah. but yeah. nice. Yeah. All right. Uh, ready to record? Welcome to another Lore You Should Know segment. I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by these fantastic lore masters, Mr. Matt Cernet. Hello. And Chris Perkins. Howdy. We are going to talk about little bits of Dungeons & Dragons lore as we do on this segment, and today is a very fascinating one uh, for you dragon lovers out there because we get to hear about some of the named Weirms of the Nerth. Uh, which it's pronounced that way <laughs> technically uh, because it's W-Y-R. Weirms of the Nerth? Weirms of the Nerth. <laughs> no. That's official, you guys. You heard it here first. Nerth. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, yeah, there's been a lot of uh, dragons that have been named over the years uh, in in the lore uh, as yes. well as More in the Forgotten Realms than any of our other established worlds, for yeah, sure. Yeah, and the idea of a named dragon is, I think, very yeah. evocative uh, to fantasy fans. I mean, I think mm -hmm. Smaug, 
and yep. and all of those. You, you remember those, the yep. first dragon you met, and, yep. and, and these yep. are yep. the dragons of the Forgotten Realms. Yep, and D&D evil D&D ones. D&D anyway. has, has, D&D has a, a few um, very well-known evil dragons, um, Tiamat, of course, being the biggest and baddest of the bunch. But well, um, we're here to talk about some of her, quote-unquote, children. Yeah. So, uh, what are some of the some of the, the weirms and how they've uh, uh, been talked about in the in Forgotten Realms? Well, there's a, there's a crap ton of them. Uh, <laughs> so, there's there's been a bunch in various adventures of products over the years. Uh, but uh, Ed Ringwood did a series of articles called Worms of the North in Dragon Magazine um, for oh gosh over a, a dozen uh, issues. Yeah. I edited a bunch of them. I remember them well. Yeah, and it's all in the brain pan. And then there were day. there were more. I guess they might have been the same articles that were put on the website. Uh, was website for a while, and so there was at one point an awesome little image. I'll turn my computer around. And totally won't be able to see it. Anybody at home? <laughs> but uh, of like all the little uh, outlines of where their territories are in different colors. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Um, yeah. So it's basically the map of the Sword Coast with different mm-hmm. colored uh, uh, ovals or, or, right. or shapes. Little to be blotches like, oh, where yeah. they overlap and where they don't and all that kind of a thing. Yeah. And um, which color they are, right? Is that based on yeah, the color, more, more the More or chromatic? less what color they are. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. That's cool. Yeah. And, and so it's it's a lot of fun. And, and basically uh, there those those areas were sort of described in the articles because Ed would talk about it's from this place to this place and that place to that place. And then, but that image, which you can probably still find somewhere online, um, it, it's called worms underscore north underscore territories dot jpg if you're gonna go search nice. for it we'll throw it up there for sure um, but it's, so, it's, yeah. it's fun and then it, there's just a ton of them that are just out there there are um, so I figured maybe we can talk about a couple whites a couple blacks a couple greens a couple blues and a couple reds I love it it's, um, it's there, like we're playing there's magic there's certainly more than that we're playing yeah, magic absolutely. gathering we here. are playing magic <laughs> gathering with dragons <laughs> um, that's a weird quinky dink yeah. um, so uh, one of the uh, most terrifying white dragons of the north is a big thug named Arothator. Uh, he has appeared most recently in uh, R.A. Salvatore's Dritz novels. Mm-hmm. Um, he played an important and devastating role in the attack on Nesme and uh, in the, the, the war of the Silver Marches. And uh, Arothator also appeared in our first uh, fifth edition adventure um, books, the uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen slash The Rise of Tiamat, uh, we, f- we featured his lair, a giant glacier called Oya Vigaton. And uh, you get to stomp around in Arathator's lair while he's there or while he's not and, and find there are like people living on his uh, glacier. And, uh, do they, and do they worship uh, Arathator? Uh, they, they kind of fear Arathator, and he keeps them alive um, mostly so that he can, you know, enjoy their fear. Um, <laughs> is that uh, a, white, of, a white dragon? He is a big white dragon, yes. Ancient, uh, yep. Ancient, ancient, ancient white dragon, and he lives in the Sea of Moving Ice, mm. um, way, way, way up in the north where, you know, you might find big giant walruses and killer whales and not much else because um, it's darn cold up there. And is that what he eats or does he yeah, usually? Uh, so, as, as, so white dragons are not particularly bright, and that's true of white dragons in the realms as well. Um, that's why I sort of described him as a thug um, because he's just a big terror. And just um, that sort of swoops down uh, shark-like and devours. Um, that's not to say he can't be reasoned with. Uh, in fact, um, good luck if you don't speak dr- draconic, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah, if you don't speak draconic, it'll be very, very, very hard uh, to stop him from eating you. Um, so uh, your best bet is to try to outwit him or hide from him or whatever and just let him go about his business. Um, and, that makes uh, sense. Yeah, his nickname is Old White Death. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not Mr. Fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> good old White Death. <laughs> good old. White death. Yes. <laughs> One of the things about the dragons of the Forgotten Realms is that they often have really, really hard to pronounce names. And then uh, Ed did us the favor of giving most of them a nickname as well. So <laughs> to spare us the pain of having to trip over their yeah. their name. So, you know, Dargothoth. Yes. You know, is the creeping doom. Okay, got okay, it. Got it. The creeping doom. <laughs> yeah, I can pronounce that. That's much easier. Yeah. Um, right. Another another ancient white dragon that lives in Arathator's neck of the woods is also a dragon that he has, I use the term loosely, tried to court Mm. from time to time. Um, She is Arve Acheris, and uh, she also um, lives way up in the middle of frozen nowhere. Um, 
her uh, ice claws, I think, is her. That's her nickname. Handle. I'll have to look it up. Uh, and uh, she's a little demented. Um, she has when you, when anybody sees her, she has a rider on her back. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And what you realize when you get close to her is that that rider is actually a dead wizard's corpse that she's basically strapped to her body and talks to as if it's still alive. Oh, geez. Yeah, she's, her nickname's actually the White Worm. Oh, that's it. Uh, okay. Spelled with a O oh, this time. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <All right. laughs> For some reason. <laughs> but yeah. Why yeah. is she, was that an, an old paramour of horror? A companion. Hers? Okay. Yeah. Uh, they 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 got along well for a number of years, and as old wizards do, they die. <laughs> Probably had a heart attack or got hit by a flying piece of ice or something. <laughs> and uh, she kept him around um, and never really got over the, the loss of him. Yeah, so she was living on, um, let's see, uh, the Ice Peak um, somewhere up in the frozen north there. And apparently that wizard's name was Meltharond, and she was sort of the... Um, companion and, and mount and servant of this super powerful wizard Meltharond and he died and she just kept on kept on trucking <laughs> 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 kept the spirit alive everything's fine <laughs> yeah everything's yeah. fine he's a very good very good wizard so, so she's a secretly broken creature um, with tremendous power at her disposal but she's also kind of a, a lonely isolated figure a sort of demon of the north yeah um, not as mean as, as uh, uh, well, not as I wouldn't, uh, Arathator is avaricious and, mm -hmm. and he marauds. Um, she sort of coasts around and has conversations with her dead friend and occasionally swoops down and grabs a Yeti and eats it. Um, she's known to, she's known to, um, drift over the Icewind Dale, um, and numerous mm -hmm. sightings of her there. Uh, ragged barbarians know better than to stay out in the open when she surfs by just in case she is hungry enough to dip down and snatch one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, um, but you know, reindeer are more her thing than you know, then smashing into Bryn Shander and stealing a bunch of people up in the, off the street. But if pushed, or if you know, someone mm -hmm. insults her, uh, yeah. her, her wizard rider, or calls, yeah. maybe even just calls attention to the fact that he's not alive anymore. <laughs> yes, I feel like that would uh, be. It's a, worth noting oh. that both Arathator and Arviatris have had children. Uh, those children still are, are laying claim to their own small domains in the north and in the Great Glacier and elsewhere. Uh, one of them was encountered and killed in uh, uh, one of the more recent Dritz novels okay. after it became the mount to uh, uh, Tiago, um, Dritz's uh, enemy. Got it. Uh, Ice Claws actually is another nickname and th also the white worm is spelled with a Y. Okay. So. All right then. <laughs> <laughs> All in the She's same got, product. She's got two Same nicknames. products. Very good. Nicknames. Okay, great. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> That's probably not Ed. That's probably not Ed. That's oh, okay. probably Ed. <laughs> Nice. All right. So white dragons, we got uh, we covered them. Uh, yes. So if we go up the chain of power, the next we'd go to is the blacks. All right. And I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, Varagamanthar. Yeah. He is a black worm that lives in the Mirror of Dead Men, which is a cold swamp on the sa on the Sword Coast, mm -hmm. uh, north of Waterdeep. And Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about the mirror? Um, Oh, it's appeal gosh. to black dragons. <laughs> um, so uh, the Mirror of Dead Men is is um, is a a swamp that was made um, in an ancient um, time when basically uh, uh, it's one of the, the the forgotten realms. There was basically yeah. a, a there used kingdom to be a kingdom there there, and there was a, a war happening between two sides, two sort of I think they were brothers. Um, and uh, for the throne, essentially, and um, they appealed to this powerful wizard who used to be a f f sort of family friend. Iniarv, I think is his yeah, name. Iniarv. And he, you know, they said, hey, Iniarv, help us out in this battle. Come on. <laughs> and <laughs> he, he overreacted. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Iniarv had, his in, solution was a little, um, shall we say, over the top. Oh, no. <laughs> Iniarv, in the meantime, uh, unbeknownst to them, had become a lich. Uh, and his solution to the problem was basically drowning everyone. Um, so he used, sides. Uh, yeah. he, he used his spell to basically draw the sea into the land and drown everyone for miles and miles and miles. I mean, not just the armies, like everybody. Yeah. And when the um, sea washed out, what was left was basically this swamp yeah, and it full became, of ruins. It became mm. a swamp filled with ruins, essentially. And, and so it's kind of yeah. like this cold, um, swampy area uh, north of Waterdeep. 
perfect for a black dragon to, yes. to make its lair. Yes, and so Varagamanthar uh, is known to dwell there. Um, what is not known, one of the greatest secrets of the region, is that he has a twin brother, where Verendor, and uh, he they go to great lengths to hide this fact. So if you go there thinking you're going to go fight one dragon, mm -hmm. what usually happens is the other one sneaks up behind you, and the two together make short work of you. Uh, wah, wah. Wah, wah. And as long as no one is able to see the two of them together. That's right. They've, 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 the they've managed to preserve the notion that it's just the one dragon. Um, and so Varagamanthar is the one that is known, and where Verendor is the one who is secret. Mm -hmm. um, but they are very, very tight. Uh, they are always working in concert. Uh, to overcome perceived enemies and to secure their domain, which they basically claim to yeah. the mirror as their domain. Mm. Um, they are the biggest, baddest dragons in that area. Um, they figured prominently in um, an adventure that was published in Dungeon um, called Eye of Merkel. It was the culmination of a series of adventures set in the Mirror of Dead Man, a five part series. Mm. Uh, that's cool. That, Are uh, twins common in amongst dragons? No. Because no. <laughs> <laughs> he seems the first <laughs> I've ever heard of it. They came out of one egg. It yeah. had to be in the same yeah. egg. Yeah. 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 That's and, fascinating. And sibling, um, just siblings living with one another among dragons is just super rare. There's a couple yes. other places in the realms that I can think of off the top of my head where that's the case. But, where, but that's usually where there's sort of like a, a a mother or father dragon or both. Asserting some control. Yeah, just sort of really dominating the, the younger children and making them work together and stuff like that. Right, because they're usually, once they get of an age, they're, yes. they, they, they fight for resources. Right. Yes, they fight for exactly. everything. Yeah, my sheep. Yeah, yeah. interesting. All right. Well, that's that's, yeah. a, that's a cool little detail about those black dragons. Mm -hmm. Is there another black dragon, or was those the two? That I you figured wanted? those are the two we could yeah, talk about. That makes sense. Um, uh, What's uh, so the next up the chain would be the green dragons. Mm -hmm. um, one of the best known is Old Gnawbone. She lives in the Crypt Garden Forest, and her real name is Cloggy Liamatar. <laughs> I um, love you, Chris Perkins. <laughs> what's striking? What's striking about her is that she is old. And uh, the reason they call her Old Gnawbone is that when she's usually sighted in the air, it's because uh, what you see is this big old sort of battered dragon uh, gnawing on what appears to be a corpse. And she just sort of lets it hang out of her mouth as she's mm. just kind of absently chewing on it. Like a cud? Yeah, like a cud. Um, so that's kind of gross. It is gross. The other interesting thing about her is she is uh, fascinated with... Uh, the happenings in the world, uh, but she basically confined. She stays for the most part in her territory, but she's hoarded a collection of crystal balls that she uses to scry on far-flung people and places, basically to keep tabs on everything. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that um, she was featured in a organized play event. Um, I think a couple years ago. It was. It mm. was. I think just at the start yeah. of fifth edition or so. Uh, yeah. But that's. Yeah. Um, she has a minor role in Storm King's Thunder. You can basically go and talk to her <laughs> uh, at great potential risk to yourself uh, as, as part of a sort of side quest. Um, but she, she is very reclusive and kind of like a lot of, like most green dragons being lawful evil, she will adhere to her agreements, but at the same time twist them where possible to her advantage. Right, right. Makes sense. Uh, um, old Nawbones. Old Nawbone. Yeah, she is a she is a beast. Um, what's a, what's another green we can talk about? Uh, Moragoth. Moragoth is another one. Um, but she lives in the Misty Forest, I believe. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, which is sort of a sort of an uh, elf hangout. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember details about her. Yeah, it's Mornagoth, I think. Mornagoth? I think there's an N in there. Yeah, it's either Moragoth or Monagoth. I can't yeah, remember. The Moor Dragon, Mornagoth. Um, and uh, she's in sort of the the High Moor area. And let's see. She, da, 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 da. Um, she's the fan of the Cult of the Dragon, which, you know, hey. <laughs> so most yeah. would be most would be right, yeah. and probably and there's probably the old cult of the dragon, the ones who were making right. dracoliches. So uh, 
I believe that uh, she has a number of children also uh, scattered around. I think uh, one of her one of her brood is named Chuth, C H U T H. Chuth. Yep. He hunts elves for sport. Mm. Yeah. Um, Morningoth actually, uh, according to the third edition, um, Dragons of Faerun, which, by the way, if you want to learn about dragons in, in Forgotten Realms, Dragons of Faerun, that's the place to go, nice. uh, is a Dracolich, actually. And Great. she travels around to several different locations via magical portals. So that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, real quick, the Quarrels of the Dragon, the old ones, how they mm-hmm. created Dracoliches. Yes. Can we talk just real quick about that? Yeah, sure. Um, they created Dracoliches. <laughs> 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 basically, if there was a Dracolich to be created, the Cult of the Dragon was behind it. Yeah. The, the Cult of the Dragon basically uh, existed. Um, uh, it gets really complicated because it has to do with a character called Sam Esther, who was originally one of the Chosen of Mistra and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, the, the Cult of the Dragon basically believed that um, Dracoliches are going to, to control the world. And so... We need to basically make it happen. So there's mm. this weird apocalyptic cult that's trying to go around and convince dragons to become dracoliches in order to to make this dominion over the world happen. Uh, so they're kind of crazy, <laughs> and yeah, a specific kind, a specific yeah. right. way. But right? what they're offering is pretty tempting to a dragon who's you know lived for four hundred years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if, and then this uh, she can travel through these magical portals yeah. to anywhere. She has great power yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and is still around, I guess, in the very realms of that. Yeah, right? we haven't said that she's died off or anything or has been killed or destroyed. It's actually pretty hard to destroy a Dracolich um, yeah. forever. Yeah. Dracoliches so have a... get on it, adventurers. Yeah. have a, like, weirder version of, of destruction, too, as well. So, like, I, and, in, and I'm not sure if we preserved it in 5th edition or not. I don't... I don't recall. So, because it used to be that you'd, you'd make a Dracolich, and it, uh, the Dracolich uh, uh, didn't have, like, a phylactery in the same way as a normal Lich. Um, like, if it, its its spirit would go into, like, the body of some other lizard nearby, and then that lizard would go back and eat the bones of the Dracolich and then become the Dracolich again. Oh. Or something strange. It was That's pretty good. <laughs> <complicated. laughs> you're, you're like, yeah, go smaller, then go bigger. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're the most powerful being in the world. Yeah. So it was very strange. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, uh, so those are the greens. Uh, do we want to do blues? Blues. Um, well, one that we showcased recently was Imrith, uh, the dragon of the statues who lives in the Anorak Desert. And uh, she uh, basically lives in these old sand-buried ruins. And the reason they call her the dragon of the statues is because she knows magic that allows her to create gargoyles. And gargoyles help guard her lair. All right. um, I'm not spoiling anything here by saying she is the main villain in Storm King's Thunder at this point. I'm sure most people know that. Um, <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Uh, we went to great lengths to try to hide that. We uh, did for a long time. For a long time. Um, I think the cat's out of the bag. The cat is out of the bag. The dragon's out of the bag, too. <laughs> and uh, so... It was a sort of our first real opportunity in fifth edition to take one of the Worms of the North and feature it centrally in the plot of a story about giants, um, building on this idea that giants and dragons have a long history of violence and conflict and ancient wars fought between them for control over supremacy over the lands and realms of the world. And uh, it is very possible that with the help of giants, you can kill Imrith at the end of Storm King's Thunder. It's also equally likely that she'll kill you. Um, or escape uh, right. uh, to, to survive yes. another day. And in that adventure, uh, she appears to the characters in uh, not only draconic form, but in the form of a storm giantess, uh, because she has infiltrated the giants to basically compound their problems um, and, and weaken them across the world. Uh, another interesting uh, blue dragon, very, very different in tone, is Alathontor. Uh, who is called the Minstrel Worm, minstrel I believe. Minstrel Worm. Ooh, I it like is that. a blue dragon um, who I believe lairs near, nearer to the coast who is fascinated with music mm. um, and and uh, has an admiration for and adoration for those who can uh, play cool. music well. That's pretty cool. I like giving 
She's a groupie. Very strong human-like qualities to these evil, yeah. large beasts. Yes, uh, it's very yeah. fascinating to me. Yeah, I think I think it just makes them more relatable, and uh, in terms of being antagonists or allies of the characters, if they can, if if players can relate to them on some human level. Yeah, and then also, I mean, that's a great example. If there's a bard in your uh, uh, retinue, like you can very yeah. easily try to curry favor with. Uh, uh, Mm-hmm. That one. What's her, what's that one called here? Alathantor. Alathantor. She's still neutral. Or sorry, lawful evil. Um, so beware. Yeah, never a good thing. But uh, yeah. I've known some evil groupies in my time. I don't think she actually plays an instrument, but maybe she does. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I'm trying to find that. Um, the one I was thinking was there's the um, bunch of hobgoblins and sort of half dragon hobgoblins that are uh, called the Blood of Maroom. Uh, or Maureen, and they are in uh, what's the, the, the let's see, it's Dragon Doom Mountain hmm. at Doom Spire Castle <laughs> <laughs> on the Doom Plains <laughs> next to Doom Town, next to Bob Doom. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. but that's that's one of those instances where there's <laughs> where there's like a basically a, a, a mother dragon who's bossing around younger dragons, but in this case, they're also bossing around a whole bunch of hobgoblins as well, so it's yeah. kind of fun. That is fun. Uh, as a side note, uh, adding to that, there are instances throughout the the realms in the Western Heartlands and the North of uh, half dragons, um, humans who have allowed their blood to become uh, f- uh, melded with that of dragons to create half dragon spawn. And that's uh, there's a there's a family that lives in the High Moor um, who have a bunch of half black dragon members, uh, nice. for instance, and they're terrible and probably best avoided at all costs yes well that is also one of the ideas of how sorcerers <coughs> have their power right? yes is because yeah. there's been yep. dragon blood yep. that's yep. been yep. passed down absolutely um so then final our final group is uh, so red dragons. final group is red dragons the biggest and baddest uh oops sorry my phone is ringing i should have shut that off no worries it's not like we're recording a podcast <laughs> or anything <laughs> oh that's my contractor i'll have to get back to him okay we got um, five minutes because we yes. just gotta do our, our red so, dragons here um clouth clouth is old snarl uh he is a big um hulking magnificent beast uh who has fought so many battles that he's got scars basically all over his body um when he was first when i first read the article that ed sent in for worms of the north one of the things that made me burst out laughing when i read it is this idea that he is um uh He's, a, like many dragons, a collector of magic items, but he actually uses them in battle. Uh, he straps wands to his wings, basically, and goes around like a fighter jet, <laughs> strafing people with them. Pew, 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 pew. No way. Yes, exactly. That is cool. Which is, which is kind of weird because, I mean, his breath weapon would already basically just incinerate <laughs> half a town. Uh, but he's still got these, like, wands of lightning bolts and things strapped to his wings uh, just to give him even more firepower. I feel like um, that's a, uh, uh, you know, he's a long lost relative of Jim Dark Magic. A little bit. Yeah. In fact, uh, he made an appearance in an Acquisitions Inc. live game, and rather than confront him, they threw all their treasure overboard <laughs> at him, <laughs> and he let good, them. Good he plan. gave him a pass. Um, <laughs> but he was so infatuated with their airship that he actually built one of his own, and that appeared in uh, the Waffle Crew um, Dice Camera Action. Nice. They met to the crew of a ship that he built, modeled after the Acquisitions Inc. ship that he saw that threw treasure at him. Um, so do red dragons often craft things? Not personally. No. Um, but he had the plans and thought about it. <laughs> but, but he's a... Build he, an airship. Build a what? <laughs> it looks like this. <laughs> what is I'm that? Putting the mental <laughs> image in the worst your picture mind. I've ever seen. Um, yeah, he's not much of an artist. Um, <laughs> but he, uh, a creature that powerful can assert its will over other creatures and make them do crazy things. Um, and Clouth being chaotic evil is no stranger to crazy. Makes sense. Um, what's interesting is he's got his own veil. Yes, um, Clouth and Veil. Clouth and Veil. It is it is a large veil amid the spine of the world mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, this sort of kind of little oasis of decent weather surrounded by blustery cold and pointy jagged ice covered peaks and things where he herds cattle and keeps basically a ready food supply mm. so that he never goes hungry any time of the year. He's got a realm um, of his own. He's got his own little empire up there uh this little home away from home and nobody oh. else goes there nobody else goes there <laughs> um it's it's kind of 
it's an odd, in some respects it's an odd place for a red dragon. You think of red dragons like to you know hide in volcanoes and things like that, and the spine of the world is about as cold and isolated and as you can imagine. Um, but there are times when a red dragon just needs to get away from it all, and uh, Clouth has figured out that he can lay claim to there, and there's really nothing around that can challenge him. No one's going to be fighting him. No other it. red dragons to uh, burden him oh, or, or encroach upon his territory, and so he's pretty confident that he'll be able to survive for indefinitely um, in that situation. Sweet. Is there another red dragon we wanted to uh, cover? Oh, there are a number. Um, one of the go-to ones is, I think, Balagos. Balagos. Um, he's farther to the south. Yes. What, what is he of the south? He's farther to the south. Oh, um, farther so to the south. Like uh, the more towards uh, Tethyr and Am. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of where where his territory is. That's that's sort of less the north than than sort of yeah. the rest of the. I'm sort trying of to setting. remember what his handle is. His um, what they refer to him as. Uh, it's a nickname. Me. See if I can get there fast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the what? flying flame. The flying flame. Oh, that's a good. That's a good nickname for a red dragon. Yeah, that makes sense. He Does, flies. Is, he breathes flame. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Combine the two. Yeah, got some alliteration going on. Yeah. What's uh? What is his characteristics? Well, Balagos. Let's find out. Uh, da, 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 da. He. He eats Boy Scouts. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Girl Scouts. And Girl Scouts. Yes. Oh gosh, he 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 stopped a war by burning down both cities. That's that's nice. <laughs> he stopped a war by burning down both yeah. sides. Yes. M- my memory of my memory of him, uh, based on the article uh, that Ed wrote, is that he is like a flying apocalypse. Yeah, uh, that when he gets himself into a lather, he just goes on a absolute tear, and everybody within four hundred miles just goes completely insane. Mm. Yeah, there were two two cities, Sailmer and Mintar, that were uh, that were having a war, and you're making too much noise. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> yes. He got upset, and so he decided to destroy both of their armies, make sure neither could have enough of an army to mount a credible attack on one another. And wow. peace was made. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> chaotic evil red dragon. You really saved yes. the day, buddy. Yes. That's pretty interesting, yeah. though. Like, I, I can imagine him being like, oh, this was too loud. I'm just trying to rest. Or, yeah, you know, and you can imagine that in the world that we describe, a creature that big and that destructive um, would be pretty hard to stop. Yeah. Um, it's a wonder that any cities can be built in the north when you account for how many dragons live there. He is one of the ones that nobody can really keep in check. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things with dragons is, is that, you know, Yes, they could, like, rip all the roofs off houses and eat the people inside, but there are things like herds of deer and sheep, and right. <laughs> you know, yes. there are, there's the, easier prey. There like, are things that are going to stab them with pitchforks, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and probably tastier, too. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. You know, so, like, and, yeah. and you, can, you can usually kill them by just breathing on them, so you don't have to go, like, right. you know, upset right. anyone. Yes, and the children of sheep aren't going to come and avenge their dead parents. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! No sheep wizards are going to show up and start casting spells. Now I want to play that character. I want to play that sheep. They're like, we must burn together. Oh god! <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. I love I love hearing about these again because I just think I think that they're great villains. Obviously, it's in the title, Dungeons and Dragons, and I think having named dragons that have personality that you can remember from from session to session makes it even more uh, flavorful and awesome. So thank you for that. That makes sense. Uh, how can people find out about more about dragons? I'm sure there's more uh, worms the north in your head that you could uh, uh, spout off their names to people there are um but i'm not going to right now but if if anybody <laughs> wants to know more about dragons uh, as pertains to the worlds of dungeons and dragons you can contact me at, on twitter at chris perkins dnd and what about you mr cernet i am at cernet s-e-r-n-e-t-t awesome all right thank you guys so much uh, i'm at greg tito don't ask me about worms of the north or i'll pronounce it we arms of the near earth again yes. uh, uh thank you very much we'll be back with another segment uh, next week all right, everybody. Uh, Force Gray, the penultimate episode, uh, the sub finale is happening very soon. Uh, we are going to go to that right about now after we play. Uh, yeah, do, do you think we'll play like a, a short bit of ads uh, as we uh, get out of here? Uh, but thank you so much for watching Dragon Talk. Uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you for subbing. For those of you who are about here, watch this awesome Force Gray episode. Uh, I you think you're really in for a treat? I think this is a really good episode, and uh, the finale will be uh, a 
again on Saturday, uh, November 18th uh, from Brooklyn, New York. It'll be at 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be showing it on this here channel. Uh, so don't forget to watch live to see Matt Mercer, Joe Manganiello, Deborah Enwall, uh, Dylan Sprouse, Utkarsh Budkar, and Marisha Ray joining as a tortle uh, in the final episode. Uh, should be lots of fun. Watch that. And if you're in the New York area, go grab tickets uh, while you can. All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week with another uh, Dragon Talk. You guys are the best. Bye.